everybody, as you wait, can make your way to your seats. We're going to be in number 138, 138, Love Lifted Me. First and last verse. Go ahead and stand me once you're there. 138. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Third verse. Souls in danger, look above, Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea, billows his will obey. He your savior wants to be, be saved today. You sing. everyone we're so glad you're here uh, heard there was a good message preached this morning sorry I could miss out on it but I'm gonna listen to it later I'm excited for that we had one uh, girl Audrey Miller get an assurance of her salvation this morning so praise the Lord for that uh, how many of you all got your afternoon nap this afternoon I know I got mine but and then it was rudely uh, interrupted by my oldest sister who came to my room stomping and jumped on top of me. So thanks to Brielle for that, but we're so glad you're all here. We're going to go ahead and pray for the evening and for the upcoming message. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for everything you give us. Please help the upcoming message. Help it as uh, it's uh, preached to us. Please calm my nerves and be with the night and turn pray. Amen. You may be seated. All right, 265, best song in the hymn book. 265. We're singing all three verses because it's my favorite. All right, every voice on that first verse, low in the grave he lay. Low in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose, with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Vainly they watch his bed, my Savior, vainly they seal the dead, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose, with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose. my Savior, he tore the bars away. You. All right. And up from the grave he arose, with the mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to Rose, he arose, hallelujah, 
like I said, we're so glad everyone's here. We want to, at this time, ask if there are any first-time visitors here tonight. If you are a first-time visitor here tonight, just raise your hand up, and our ushers will give you a card, and you'll be able to get a cup with some chocolates in it, I believe. If you are a first-time visitor, just raise your hand. I don't see any here tonight, so it looks like it's just us. So, glad you all are here. I think at this time we're going to go and do some scripture songs right now. So we're going to do Joshua 1.8, and then we are learning a new one tonight. So everyone, please stand up. Joshua 1, Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, the normal one. This book of the law, and then Joshua 1.9. This book of the law shall not be. Part out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make their way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. All right, very good. We're going to sing it again. And like I say every week, let's try to sing it with a smile on our face and a pep in our step. Here we go. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. That thou mayest observe to do all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. I still can't figure out the ending of that song, so that's on me. One of these days I'll learn it, I promise. But all right, so now we're going to go over and we're going to learn a new one. And Briello is actually going to come up here and help me lead it. Joshua 1 9, it says, Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be dismayed. For the Lord our God is, I can't read, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. You know this one, right? All right, so this one's a fun one. I really enjoy it. And uh, it's a pretty peppy one. It's a fun one for us to learn again. And it's important for us Christians to know. Here we go. Be strong in the up pretty fast so we'll go over it a few more times to try to get familiar with it. Here we go. Be strong and up your courage. Be not afraid and be the same. For the Lord our God is with thee. Where's our land? Now go west. Be not afraid and be the same. Let's really think about that as Christians, we need to be strong. We need to be have a good courage because we don't have any reason to be afraid. The Lord thy God is with us whithersoever we go. Don't be afraid. Don't be scared. Let's sing it one more time. Let's really try to sing it out this time. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. Have a time of fellowship with one another. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, 
and now I am happy all the day. Go ahead and shake hands. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Second verse, was it for crimes that I have done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all. Fourth verse, but drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Dear Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. You sing. seated.
that great song there. Praise the Lord for that. And what a blessing it is. You know, in life, every once in a while, you may have been asked this. I know I've been asked it a few times in my ministry. And, and uh, you'll get asked by somebody, do you really care, right? I get asked that every once in a while as a pastor. Do you really care? That's an awkward question to answer. I mean, just what do I have to do to prove to you that I care, right? What, what more does something have to Everybody has different measuring sticks for that, right? You weren't there for that event, or you were there for that event, therefore you care, and all that stuff. And Everybody has measuring sticks for that, you know? But I was asked that question recently, and even in the last year or two, I've been asked that question by somebody, too. And I got a little frustrated by that question because, yeah, there's a part of me that wants to say, what do you think? Of course I care, but you can't really say that. And then the Lord reminded me how many times we ask him that question. Shame on me forever asking the Lord if he cares. And that song right there made me think about how much he cares. He does care. He does care. I think we sometimes think he doesn't because he doesn't answer or fix a problem the way we think it should be fixed. Don't ever forget, the way God fixes things are a whole lot better than the way that I can fix things. So praise the Lord that he does care. And that song is beautiful. I love hearing our young people sing. Well, September on Sunday evenings, we're going to kind of do some uh, sp special things throughout the month of September on Sunday evenings. Of course, next Sunday evening, we have a treat. We're going to have Brother Tony Smith preach for us uh, after our Patriot service in the morning. So that'll be great. Uh, two weeks from tonight, Brother Bussey will be preaching that night. I believe, believe it'll be his last service. Uh, I did check on him today. Everything's going well there this morning. But he's preaching. And then on the 25th, um, oh, my soul, I just drew a blank on who's preaching the Sunday night, the 25th. Oh, it'll, be, it'll still be Deaf Awareness Sunday, so it'll be a different Sunday service than normal. We thought we would just do it Sunday morning, but the deaf have requested to go ahead and make it. If we're calling it Deaf Awareness Sunday, it's not just going to be Deaf Awareness Sunday a.m., Deaf Awareness Sunday p.m. It's going to be all day that Sunday. And so this, and Branson's going to be preaching a, a week from this Wednesday night on September 14th. And I went and asked Grant to get a message ready about a week or two back, and uh, I asked him to preach tonight. So Sunday evenings throughout the month of September, get a treat and get somebody besides me, different voice, and uh, so that'll be it'll be a good month of Sunday evenings in September, and so that'll be great. And I, I, I appreciate what Grant and Braden Branson are doing, and we got a lot of other young preacher boys that are coming up, and uh, they'll be preaching more as time goes. Toby got called to preach this summer, Preston. I think he'll have opportunities to preach, too. Of course, Eric is in college now training. And the Branson and Brain aren't here tonight. And then I'm missing a preacher boy. What? Travis, my soul, shame on me. Travis got to preach Deaf Church last Sunday morning on prayer. And I enjoyed that. I watched it later. And he did a great job. And uh, what's that? And CJ. CJ, where's CJ at? There he is. And he's just more new, newer called to preach. And, uh, and some of the old timers do not share their pulpits with the young preacher boys. And they don't. But I'm... And I, that's fine. They can do that. But I, I, I have a problem with that. I think God would share his pulpit with the young. I mean, he let, he let Samuel start young. He let David start young. He let Jesus start young at 12. And uh, for, for them to go ahead and stand in this place and, and to start preaching early on and learn how to do this, you know. My wife and I were talking the other day, and she's like, you know, we talked about, you know, hiring and stuff and looking at younger people possibly to hire down the road and she goes, well, so-and-so might be too young or so-and-so. I said, I started pastoring at 22. And she's like, oh, yeah, sometimes we forget that, you know. God does let people start young. Start young if they got that passion, that desire. And to thank the Lord for the older time. We know these preacher boys are going to be fired up preaching the next time, every time they preach. Because Brother Samson has prayed over them. And if you have not seen his shirt tonight, it's a perfect election shirt for this night cycle. So you may want to get a selfie with Brother Samson tonight. Your wife is shaking her head, but I think it's an awesome shirt. I just think it's an awesome shirt. So I sure do love and appreciate you, church. And I hope, I hope everybody in this church knows you care. And I hope when you come here and you sit and you look to the left, that building's evidence that somebody cares for you. Um, we don't just build those things to, to look pretty. They, that, that building is proof that somebody in this building cares about somebody else. And so... Sure do love and appreciate your church. So Lado's going to come sing for us. Miss Jennifer's going to be on the piano again. Same song as this morning. Beautiful song. Blessings. And then Grant will come preach for us tonight. Thank you so much.
We pray for blessings. We pray for peace. Comfort for family. Protection while we sleep. We pray for healing, for prosperity. We pray for your mighty hand to ease our suffering. And all the while you hear each spoken need, you love us way too much to give us lesser things. What if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? What if trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? We pray for wisdom, your voice to hear. We cry in anger when we cannot feel you near. We doubt your goodness, we doubt your love. As if every promise from your word is not enough. And all the while you hear each desperate plea and long that we'd have faith to believe. Cause what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? What if trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? When friends betray us, when darkness seems to win, we know that pain reminds this heart that this is not, this is not our home. It's not our home. Because mm. what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? What if my greatest disappointments or the aching of this life is the revealing of a greater thirst this world can't satisfy? What if the trials of this life, the rain, the storms, the hardest times, are your mercies in disguise? Are we on? Are we on? Okay, everyone can hear me? All righty, so I'm thankful for the opportunity to be up here, be able to speak to you guys tonight. If you have a Bible, turn to Acts 28. A few weeks ago, Dad asked me if I would uh, speak, and I was just, I've been really looking forward to this message. God gave me this message a while ago. Brother Charlie can't hear it. He wants someone to help him out there. If someone could help, Brother Charlie can't hear it. But um, my dad gave me, told me I have the opportunity to speak a while ago. And uh, God put this message on my heart a few months ago, actually. So I've been, I've been meditating on it. I've been thinking on it. I hope it comes across good. Uh, and I hope everyone gets something out of it. But before we get into it, I want to ask one question. Lately, I've been trying to wear a vest lately and uh, co trying to copy my dad's style a little bit. But um, I want to have a vote really quick. If you think my dad wears the vest better, raise your hand. If you think I wear the vest better, raise it. Thank you, Minus. Thank you, Minus Briella and my mom. But thank you guys very much. Now all I got to work on is uh, and this, and we'll be set. We'll be set. All right. No, but all jokes. I just thank you, Dad, for letting me come up here. All right. Oh, no, he's got me beat on that one. I'll admit it. I'll admit it. All right. Acts 28, verses 1 through 6. 
Uh, we'll be reading uh, all the six verses right now, and the sound room guys be ready to put the title up there uh, in just a second. But in Acts 28, verse number says, it's, uh, verse number one, it says, <clears throat> And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. And the bar- barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us, everyone because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Today I'm going to be preaching on Shake It Off. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you so much, Lord, for the opportunity for me to be able to come up here and uh, speak and give what you've given me these past few weeks and months. Lord, I pray, Lord, that this message will be a blessing to some people, Lord, and all the glory and honor will uh, go to you, Lord, and some people will be able to shake off uh, every, anything that's holding them back in their life, Lord. And Thank you for everything you do for us. Be with this evening. Thank you for being a good God. In this name I pray, amen. Also, I forgot to warn you, if I do just fall over in the middle of the message, I'm okay. I just fainted. All right, so today I'm going to be talking about everyone's favorite animal. I don't know if you can tell by uh, the title up there, but everyone's favorite animal, snakes. Snakes, snakes, snakes. How many people in here, you're actually like me, you know, you're, you're like a normal person. You think snakes are kind of cool. You know, they slither around. They're kind of cool. They're fun. They're cool to look at, cool to watch, eat stuff or whatever. You think snakes are just really good, and they eat mice, they eat bad bugs, and you think they're a good circle of life, and you think they're good for nature. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Thank you. Thank you, everyone in here who thinks snakes are normal. Now, I guess I should ask, how many in here think snakes are just vile, disgusting creatures, that every dead snake is a good snake? You think every snake needs to be killed, every snake needs to be gone. There's no need for snakes in this world. I'll be praying for each and every one of you for trying to kill God's creation. All right. No, but seriously, it is sad to see how many people of you hate snakes. I'm just, I'm just messing. I'm just messing. Okay, but how many of you can remember for the first time when you first ever saw a snake, I know that some, for some of you, that's way long ago. I'm just messing, I'm just messing. Okay, no, 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 I'm just messing. All right, no, but I remember the first time I ever saw a snake, and it was at, well, I have two experiences. I don't really remember actually which one is the first one, but one of the two is I was at the zoo, of course, and I saw this weird, cool thing that was looking like something, and I saw it, and I was like, that is cool. I remember thinking, that is, like, really cool. It's just slithering around. It's, like, curled up in a ball. It can do all of the above. It's, like, super flexible and stuff. I was like, man, that is a cool animal. I found out it was a snake. The other experience I have is uh, my dad, there's actually video footage of it. He's holding a little garter snake, a little garter snake that most of you would actually kill. It's about this, this skinny, about, like, that long. But he's holding it, and it's trying to bite his hand. It's swinging up and down. He's doing some kind of weird Australian accent trying to imitate Steve Irwin. But, um... <laughs> No, yeah, but that was one of the other experiences. I just remember I've always been fascinated by snakes. I thought, oh, wow, snakes are just, they're cool. I don't know why everyone hates them. I thought snakes were cool, but how many of you can remember the first time that you ever experienced a snake? If that were you, just raise your hand. Okay, but I want to be talking today, well, before we get into that, um, obviously I was fascinated by snakes, and I want everyone to know that there are not not all snakes are bad. Obviously, there's some poisonous snakes like cobras and vipers and black mambas and so on and so on and so on, but not all snakes are bad. I just want to get that across. We don't have to kill every snake we see. Okay, now that that's said, I want to talk to you us today about spiritual snakes, spiritual vipers in our life. Spiritual vipers that can bite you, that can take you down, and that can destroy your Christian life, your Christian walk with God, your Christian, uh, just your Christian environment, everything about it, because a, a spiritual viper will bite you. So here we read about in the Bible that Paul, he had just been, uh, he had been arrested, and he's being moved to somewhere else, and he's on the ship when all of a sudden the ship gets in a shipwreck, 
And everyone on that boat, we, as we know, everyone on the boat survives, and they get stranded on this island of Melita. And there's barbarous people there that, you know, they probably have no idea about anything. They're barbarous. They don't have any experience with anything that's going on. They don't know any news, probably. They're just on the island. They see all these people here. And we see, as soon as Paul gets here, here's a little point I want to throw out. As soon as Paul gets there, he just got shipwrecked, but he's serving other people. He's helping other people. He's not worried about himself. He's already serving and helping other people. But the first thought I want to give on right here is, Today, as Christians, Paul right here, it tells us that he's gathering sticks. He's gathering sticks, and he's helping the barbarous people when all of a sudden a viper bites you. And I want to throw out there that sometimes as Christians, we're living our Christian life. We're doing everything right. We're on spiritual fire for God. We're bringing people to church. We're giving to the church. We're being involved in church when all of a sudden a spiritual viper can bite you and get you down. And today, I want to talk about a few of the most common vipers that I've seen in my life that we as Christians need to shake off. Number one, shake off the viper of sin. This one can pretty much cover everything I don't say today because sin pretty much covers everything. But Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, I think we all know it. Let me turn there really quick just so I don't mess it up. Hebrews 12, verse 1, it says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every way in the sin which just so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Like I already said, I want to start off today with the most obvious one that we can experience, and that is the viper of sin. Christians today are in bondage of sin. They're holding on to sin. They're either uh, in bondage of sin and they can't shake it off, or they're holding on to it because it's their choice. They want to hold it on. They don't want to shake it off. They're promoting their sin. People are promoting their sin nowadays, and they're in bondage of the viper of sin. As Christians, we need to escape the, we need to shake off the viper of sin. We think the only, um, sorry, we, uh, we think that it's okay if we have the viper of sin because either it's going gonna, it's gonna to get better at some point or we can eventually just, we can continue to keep asking God for forgiveness each night and because God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, we don't need to get right because God will always be there to forgive us, but that is not right. If we, if we as Christians, we need to grow our personal Christian life with God and we need to grow as Christians and we need to shake off that viper of sin. So you need to make the decision today to shake off the viper of sin and not let it latch back onto you. And sure, that sin might seem good, it might seem fun, it might seem popular, but you need to shake off that viper of sin. And let me tell you right now, you may be thinking, how? How do I shake off the viper of sin? How do I get rid of this? There's no way for me to possibly get rid of this. You're addicted to it or you're so far into it, there's nothing you can do. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. We can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. That is the way to get rid of your sin. You can shake it off because Christ can give you the strength. You ask God for the strength to do it, and you have Christ as your personal Savior. He can give you the strength to shake off that viper of sin. Also, there's another thing. You can have an accountability partner. You can talk to someone about your sin. You can try, if you really are serious about getting rid of it, you can talk to someone and figure it out. So shake off the viper of sin. Next, I want to talk about shake off the viper of doubt. The viper of doubt. Ephesians 2 Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9, it says, For by grace are you saved by uh, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The viper of doubt. If the devil can't get you with the viper of sin or of any other viper, he's gonna get you with the viper of doubt. He'll tell you that you aren't actually saved or you prayed a fake prayer and you just muttered words or you, you didn't mean it. You were too young when you did it. But let me tell you right now, the truth is it doesn't matter what you said. It doesn't matter how you said it. It doesn't matter if you were too young. If you called upon the name of the Lord, like it says in Romans 10, 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, then you are saved. If you've called upon the name of the Lord, you are saved. And the people doubt and doubt and doubt. And Satan makes us doubt and doubt and doubt our salvation. And we need to uh, figure out for ourselves that we're saved. And a way to do that is by getting in the Bible. The Bible is one of the most important things in your life. And if you're not in this Bible every day, you're not obviously going to be as close to the Lord as you need to be. And obviously Satan can get you off guard because you're not going to be in his word every day. He's not going to he's going to be uh, attacking you more and you're going to be weaker than you should be. But the Bible has the answer to everything. You're doubting your salvation, the Bible has the answer. You're doubting uh, whether or not your kids are saved, the Bible has the answer. You can uh, witness to people, you can uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. But the Bible has the answers for everything. I feel like the Bible 
isn't as important to Christians as it needs to be. Like my dad says all the time, the Bible, I, I don't want to be disrespectful, but the Bible is, I don't want to say useless, but it's useless without a partner. Like the illustration my dad always gives with the gun and a shooter, if the gun doesn't have the shooter, the, guns, the gun can't harm anyone, the gun can't shoot itself, but if the gun has the shooter, uh, then the shooter can shoot the gun and the shooter can shoot its stuff or whatever. Same thing applies with the Bible. If we don't use the Bible how we're supposed to be commanded to use the Bible, then what's the point? You, the, God gave us the Bible for a reason, and that's to get in it and grow in it and to use it against the devil and to use it against the world and use it against sin, and we need to get in our Bible more. We need to live by faith and trust God once again. Sorry, that whole Bible thing was a little free right there, but we need to get in the Bible, and we need to live by faith, and we need to uh, fight off the devil because the, the devil knows that if he can get you to doubt your salvation, that you won't be as strong as a Christian as you need to be, and you be, won't be able to serve as much as you need to be able to be. So shake off the snake of doubt, the viper of doubt, and to trust God's word and put your faith in Christ and believe in the Lord. And let me just say really quick, if you haven't done that already, if you haven't been saved, you haven't asked Christ into your heart, why not go ahead and settle that tonight? Why not go ahead and ask Jesus in your heart and ask him for salvation? And if you really are serious about that, if you're serious about getting salvation and getting saved and knowing God, then come at the altar uh, at invitation time and get that settled. And if you have doubt in your life, get rid of that doubt and talk to someone. Are you, gonna, are you willing to risk your eternity on a little bit of pride or something? Are you willing to risk your doubt and your shame and all of that, or an eternity in hell or an eternity in heaven, all because you had a little bit of pride in your life? Get rid of that pride and come and talk to someone about either you're doubting or if you're not sure you're saved, talk to someone about that. So shake off the viper of doubt. My third point is shake off the viper of fear. 2 Timothy 1.7, for God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I have two little sub points under this point, but in 2 Timothy 1.7, let me read it again. It says, for God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Uh, I could go a whole bunch of different directions with this, but first I want to talk about shake off the viper of fear with soul winning. We, as Christians, we've become so afraid to witness to people. We've become so afraid to talk to other people about Christ. We've been so afraid to witness to people, to lead people to Christ, to reach people. And we've become afraid about getting rejected or getting shut down because they don't want to listen to us. Or we've been afraid about what people will think of us if we witness to people. And I know you've heard this so many times, but this is what we need to hear as Christians. And we need to be able to overcome our fear of witnessing. We need to become over fear, overcome our fear of soul winning. And we need to reach people. People for Christ again. I want to tell you a quote I've heard recently that really uh, helped me. I heard it about a few weeks ago on the car ride to football practice in a, in a message. It says, everyone has to spend eternity somewhere. Let me read that again. Everyone has to spend an eternity somewhere. I don't know where that quote originated, but oh, how powerful it is. If you think about the fact that your neighbor or your friends or your coworkers, they have to spend an eternity somewhere. That could be hell and that can be heaven and only you can maybe help with that. You could be the only chance that someone gets at the gospel of Christ. So I want you guys to think about that. I want to tell one more story I heard in a message recently. It says, uh, the story goes like this. There's a lawyer and a preacher that became friends somehow. They, I don't know how they became friends, but they became friends. And the preacher asked the lawyer, and he says, how about we go on a camping trip, a week-long camping trip, just me and you, just fishing, hunting, all of the above, just having a good time. And the preacher's talking to the lawyer and everything, and the lawyer agrees to it. And the preacher's whole time is thinking, this is where I can witness the lawyer. This is where I can reach him for Christ. This is where he can get saved, and I can lead him to the Lord. So they go on the trip, and they have a great time. They bond. They get closer as friends. They have a, such a great time. And the preacher says nothing about it the whole time because he's trying to He's trying to slowly but surely plant the seed. And then finally, it's like Saturday, they're on their way home, and the preacher looks at the lawyer in the ride home. The preacher says, I don't know his name, we'll just say Joe. Joe, do you believe in God? And Joe looks at the preacher, he says, yeah, yeah, I believe in God. And the preacher looks at Joe, he says, Joe, do you believe that there's a heaven? And Joe goes, yeah, yeah, I believe there's a heaven. And the preacher looks at, the, at Joe and he says, Joe, do you believe there's a hell? And the, and the lawyer says, Joe says, yeah, yeah, I believe that. And he says, well, can I show you how you can go to know for sure how you, when you die you can go to heaven? And the lawyer goes, hold on, preacher. He goes, do you believe that there's a God? And the preacher goes, yeah, yeah, of course, I'm asking you that. And the lawyer goes, 
do you believe that there's a heaven? And the preacher's like, yeah, yeah, I want to talk to you about it. And the lawyer goes, do you believe there's a hell? And the preacher goes, yes, of course. I, that's literally what I want to talk to you. And the lawyer says, if you believed, you would have told me the first day because you would have had an urgency for my lost soul on my way to hell. And right there, that story really talked to me and it really burdened me because right there, we're so scared to witness to people when we need to understand that that person, we could be their only chance at getting to heaven. We could be the only person that witnesses to them and tells them the gospel story. And we need to understand how important it is that not unlike not like that preacher we need to be witnessing as soon as we get the opportunity we need to be witnessing to lost souls to newcomers as soon i mean we don't want to be overbearing or scary with it but we do need to be a better witness about uh in our christian life uh another thing uh with the viper of fear is sorry shake off the viper of fear of the unknown so many christians today are obsessed with the unknown, and we're distracted by the unknown. We're afraid about the results of the unknown. We're afraid what's going to happen in the next upcoming week. We're afraid what's going to happen with the upcoming election, the upcoming uh, voting, everything. We're afraid with uh, business, with jobs, with a job interview, with our kids, with our parents, with our family. We're afraid about everything, the unknown, where as Christians, we need to put our faith and our trust, and we need to understand that the unknown is in God's hand. God has a perfect plan for each and every one of us every single day and every single second of our lives. Everything that's going to happen, God already planned for you, and God has a plan for you that's going to happen. We need to understand that the unknown is not in our hands. It's in God's hands. We need to not be afraid of what is going to happen, and we need to start in, uh, being excited and anticipating about what God has for us. In Romans 8, 28, it says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to to his purpose. And right there I want to talk about if we're living for God and we're living truly just to please God and we're not living for the applause of man, we're living to glorify God in everything we do, we don't need to worry about what the future has. It says right there that all things work together for good to them that love God. If you truly love God and you're truly trying to live for him, don't worry. It's all going to work out, I promise you. So shake off the viper of fear. My last and final point is shake off the viper of bitterness. Hebrews 12, 15, it says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, thereby many be defiled. Ephesians 4, 31, it says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Uh-oh, I brought up bitterness. I, so, I know so many Christians right now, I brought up bitterness, you shut off, that's it. You have bitterness in your heart, but you know, you don't want to accept it, you don't want to challenge it, you just want to leave it there, it's okay, it's just a little bit of bitterness. But listen up, please, I beg of you to listen up, because I know how much bitterness can wreck a life. And I know some of you have been really wronged in here, I know some situations that you've been through are awful, and you feel like you have a right to be bitter, but let me tell you right now, there is no right for us to be bitter. God's given us so much in this life, God's given us opportunities and blessings day after after day and day after day and we need to not be bitter as Christians me personally I used to be bitter I had situations I was bitter about I had reasons that I had bitterness in my life and I know me personally as a Christian when I shook off that viper of doubt when, or I mean bitterness and when I shook it off I felt a load taken off my back I gave it to God I got rid of that bitterness and God completely helped me and I felt my spiritual life as a Christian grow up go up and I want to challenge you guys to shake off the viper of bitterness and I realize that some of you have bitterness and you've had it for a long, long time, and I realize that it's hard to let go of it. It's hard to give it up, but right now, I want to tell you guys to give up that viper of bitterness. I'm almost done, but before we finish up this message, I just want to give one last thought. In Acts 28, back to our uh, text verse. Let me turn there really quick. Verses uh, 1 through 6. I won't read them all again. We'll just start in verse number 3, and we'll go to verse number 5. And it says, And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And this is a verse I really want to emphasize right here, verse number five. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. I want us to make one last point. I want to make one last point here, and that is, my last thought is, you can make the decision to shake off the viper, and you can make the decision to shake it off and shake it off again and again. And that viper, 
can keep biting you and biting you and biting you until you finally realize that you need to shake it off into the fire and let that viper die. You need to let that viper die once and for all and make the decision to shake off that viper into the fire and give it all to God. Come to this altar and get rid of your, uh, get rid of your sin, get rid of your fear, get rid of your bitterness, get rid of your doubt, give it all to God and shake off the viper. Whatever it is you have in your life, shake off that viper and sh don't just shake it off, shake it off in the sin and make that decision once and for all to give it to God. So shake off your viper. Thank you. Hello, Pastor Randy Dignan here from Bible Baptist Church in Jefferson City, Missouri. I'm going to take a moment and express to you what our main vision and purpose is of this ministry. You see, much of this world today has a question. It's a question that was asked in John chapter 3 by one person. It's a question that is asked by the masses, but when you really think about it, it's really a question we all have to come to grips with, face to face with, one on one in our lives, sometime in our life. The question is this. Where will I spend eternity? And that question was asked by a religious leader by the name of Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He approached Jesus Christ in the middle of the night and had a question about spiritual matters. Well, good thing for Nicodemus. He came to the right person at the right time because Jesus Christ is the answer in spiritual matters. You see, many of us have questions about that, and man has tried in many of its efforts to answer that question with their own ideas and philosophies. We've tried to come up with ideas on how to get us to heaven, how to confirm our way to heaven. But the fact is we've got to find out what God says about eternal things. And that's why asking Jesus Christ that question is so vital. Because when you ask Jesus a question, you get the answer. And as the question was asked, Jesus answered simply this. You must be born again. In John chapter 3, that's what he said to Nicodemus. And that's the same thing he says to you and to me even today. You see, God is God of this universe, but he's not everybody's father. What does that have to do with John chapter 3? Well, think about this. We all have birthdays. We all are physically born under this physical planet. Or else you wouldn't be able to watch me or I'd be able to sign to you right now or talk to you at this time. But God, being a spiritual being, knew that though our bodies are temporal, our spiritual part of us, our spiritual anatomy of us, is an eternal thing. And so God says, I'm more concerned about the spiritual issues. And that's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you and me 2,000 years ago and live again three days later so that you and I can have a spiritual birthday and know for sure that heaven is our home. Well, that leads to the next question. Why do we need a spiritual birthday? Well, it's simple. We're all sinners. We've all broken God's law and God's commands. But God loves us so much so that he let Jesus Christ become the substitute for your sin and my sin. So that if we recognize and admit that we are sinners, we can then trust in Jesus Christ as our substitute. And more so than that, our personal Savior and know that on top of our physical birthdays, we have a spiritual birthday now in that God becomes our father, we become his sons, daughters, we become his children, and we know we're going to go to heaven someday. My friend, it's very simple. It's not about what the church says, what I have ideas about, or what you have ideas about. It's finding out what God says directly to you and me. And he did it right there in the Bible, and in particular, John chapter 3, when Jesus says, you must be born again. If our church can help you with that question, if you have any questions about that, we can give you some answers. We'd be glad to help you in any way we can. Again, Pastor Randy, personally thanking you for watching the message. And again, if there's anything we can do for you, let us know. God bless and make it a great day.